I should begin with noting that I will end this video with corrections from the previous videos. Because I've been documenting my learning process with technology that's new to me, I will naturally make mistakes. And with each day, I learn a bit more and it becomes more glaringly obvious what I got wrong previously. Um, so if you're a more if you're more experienced with machine learning than I am, I welcome your feedback. Just leave it in the comments under the video. So in the previous video, I attempted to improve training accuracy by truncating data. You're, you'll, you will recall that for each of the four second wave files on disk, I had created a spectrogram representing the sound, a, 10 by, a 1025 by 173 matrix. And let's just run everything here again. Since the training was taking so long to run and produced poor results, I had decided to downsample the spectrogram. I wanted to reduce the number of rows, but maintain the features. So for each of the spectrograms, I discarded 75% of the rows. I just lobbed them off the front, effectively discarding three of the four seconds of audio information. So for this new notebook, I'm tweaking that idea. This time I opted to grab frequency slices throughout the four seconds of audio. I experimented and I found I like the result of taking every fifth slice. Let's go ahead and load up the previous STFTs. And I'm going to decimate the results and show an example. Um, I came uh, to this number of grabbing the every fifth slice just by experimenting. Um, I just tried the different decimation levels, like I took out every other every other sample, then I took maybe every other, and I say sample, it should be like a slice, because we're taking a slice of time for which a, the frequency spectrum was generated. And so I was kind of grabbing every other slice, and then I thought, well, every, maybe every third slice. And once I got to a point where I could um, see the pattern and retain enough of the original data information to be recognizable by my eye, but not uh, so much that it's it's not so overly simplified that I would lose my recognition recognition of the original pattern. And I thought, well, that seems like it would be good. So this looked good to me. It looks a lot like the original pattern. I'm talking about this this uh, uh, this first histogram here, except very downsampled, um, but still retains a lot of the essential information. So I then took the uh, First, I went ahead and split the train labels, and test labels out. And then I went ahead and took 12 representations and spit them out. And again, if visually this looks good to my eye, if I could easily, for example, find a line that sep that separates two parts of this visual, then I think the data is also going to be nice for uh, for the, the machine learning algorithm. So we're just taking a look here. This is what we're ending up with. These are nice representations. Okay, so next let's scale our values in preparation for training, build the model, create an instance of the model, and print out a summary. It's still a simple model that's only two layers deep at this point. Uh, build the model. This is all from last time. Create an instance of the model, print out a model summary. Make sure that we can pass our data. Um, just a little training, just a little sample to make sure that we're getting back some numbers, not some kind of error. Uh, I just want to see the shape of everything, so I print that out. And let's go ahead and fit it. And evaluation starting. Pull this down a little bit so we can see what's happening. As you can see, the, the loss is decreasing and the accuracy is going up. It's actually going up pretty quickly. Uh, you see I've, I worked with 24 epics. Uh, I did ran this several times with different number of epics until I found them out where it seems like the accuracy number was kind of settling around a particular area. Like it gets, it jumps pretty high at first, like from 31% uh, up to 80%. And then when it gets right around 95, 96, 97%, kind of evens out. And I think maybe I've hit, hit my magic mark. 98%. Twenty-one of twenty-four. We've got just three more to go. So when I first saw this result yesterday, I thought when I was working on this code before I shared it with you, I thought, "Hey, this is pretty good." Ninety-eight percent. And then I turned around and uh, ran it on my test data. Ran it, 
I fit it instead of evaluating. And I'll get to that in a moment. And I tricked myself into going, God, that's also 98%. Oh my God, I'm, I'm kicking butt. I mean, in my first, first try here and I've got 98%, but there was a mistake because I should have been evaluating. Um, I should have been doing exactly what we're going to see we do right now. So the, the test data that we split off, we're now, we, we previously we were training, uh, training the model based upon our trained data. It's been trained. It looks pretty good to me. The accuracy, according to this, is 98%. The uh, <clears throat> evaluation is going to look at some data that the model hasn't seen at all before. So it's going to give me a much truer representation of how accurate my results are. So I'm going to hit enter. And lo and behold, this time around, it gave me a really terrible result, 57%. So just a little over half uh, of the results were accurate. Now, I'm, of course, disappointed, but it also it's to be expected. But I'll come back to my disappointment in a moment. The last time I ran this, instead of 57%, I came up with a 62% score. And that's still a terrible result. And I'm not sure if that's because I don't yet have enough training data or if I need to add additional layers to my model or to change my hyperparameters. Um, however, I can test even just with what I've gained with my model, with my imperfect model that this time around is only producing an accuracy of 57%. I can test individual files that are sitting on my drive that don't have a label and just see how well they perform. Uh, and so what I did here was I quickly wrote a few functions to help me with that. And let's, let's review what I did. I should mention that since this data set is from Kaggle, I have a directory of unlabeled files that were also provided it's in a test directory. Now, the idea is that you can do your final evaluation on this test set and upload your scores, but it doesn't actually tell you, it doesn't have any of the labels for it. So I have a bunch of files, but without any descriptions of the content. Um, so that's the only way for me to really kind of evaluate them is to just load them up individually, run them, evaluate them against my model and see what kind of scores produced. And then, um, and so, so I'll, I'll basically have the class defined, it'll be classified and then listen to the sample and go, does this sound accurate to me? So here I've just loaded up a few of those uh, files from the test audio. Now let's go, I'm about to, to load them up. Enter, 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 enter. So our first sound is. Now to me, that sounds like either a jackhammer or street noise, but to my ear, I can't really tell. So I'm pretty sure the model will have difficulty as well. And that's definitely children playing. That's so easy to recognize. I would hope that the model would be able to get it right. And I'm just gonna grab another one here that I know is a little different. Lots of ambient noise with a siren in the background. So this one should be classified as a siren. Now to evaluate these files, these unlabeled files, I have to put them through all of the same processing that I did my training data so that it's an apples to apples match. So I'm going to have to first load up my files off the, the wave files off the hard drive, convert them to STFTs. I'm going to, and I'll just show you here. I wrote a little, not that one. I need to get over here, click function. It's my little function I wrote. Um, I'm just going to grab 10 of the test files and process them. And it takes a little, just a little moment. And then whenever I'm done with that, I'll go ahead through the decimation process to kind of reduce their overall size. And then I'm going to shape, <laughs> little function, shape me up, which basically just reshapes the array for the, uh, so it can be used with the model and then converts uh, each uh, to be within the range between zero and one. So we'll do that. This is our final shape. I've got 10 files uh, and each I have 10 samples and each one is an array of 5,536. And I'm going to grab the first file name. It's uh, 2146.wave. Here's the audio for it. File name one, it's children playing. And now I'm going to call, uh, make predictions on this set. Again, I need to actually click over here first. Here are my predictions. As you can see, I get back a probability distribution, and each column corresponds to a class name. And here I'm just going to print out those predictions so, so they're easy to look at. 
Okay, so <laughs> this model, we already know this model is what 56% accurate. It's going to be a crapshoot if it gets any of these right. Um, but it, currently it predicts that uh, 3957 wave is a siren, the 2146 is children playing. Let's just go down here and grab a couple of these and see if we get them right. 3957, could it be a siren? So I've just done this too. It'd be nice if I could uh, use this audio function in, in a loop, but it doesn't seem to be capable in a notebook, so I have to do one at a time. All right, 3957. Let's see what it sounds like. That does not sound like a siren, which is what I believe it, said, it predicted. So that's bad. That was a bad prediction. 2146. Twenty-one forty-six is children playing, so we correctly predicted that. Now, I have to tell you that these results today, just the manual results, I call this, the, I guess, the manual um, evaluation of the predictions, where I'm just kind of loading the sound, playing it back, and seeing if it matches with the classification. I had much better luck with this previously than I am today because I made a correction because I found a glaring emission in my previous code. So it's time to get to corrections. These are the corrections from yesterday's video. In the last video, I had split the test and train uh, data sets, but instead of training on the train data and evaluating the test data, I mistakenly trained on both. I called fit on both sets. And then I talked about the comparison between my training results and the test results. And of course, that makes no sense because I had not done any evaluation. There was nothing to compare there. I also said, quote, my training data accuracy is lower than my test data, which means it is not overfitted, end quote. Well, that was wrong, not only because I had not evaluated, but actually just incorrect in the, 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 the meat of what I was saying there. Actually, if my test accuracy is more than just a little bit lower than my train accuracy, then overfitting has probably occurred. So just got that detail wrong. I shouldn't even talk about overfitting until I get a little bit further along the, the, the way of this learning process. But there was one positive outcome for my mistake. Because I used the complete 4,553 samples to train on, because I had called fit on both my test and train data, my accuracy was a lot better. And when I was manually evaluating this set before I made my correction, the results were a lot better, which makes a lot of sense, right? I had a lot more training data and I, it, was, it seemed to be much more accurate. Well, how much more accurate with just that additional 1,000-ish uh, uh, samples? Well, to get that number, we'll have to wait until next time to see those results.